And uh, we want to uh, continue to look at being fully persuaded. And uh, Romans chapter 4 and verse 17, again a very familiar scripture, but a very good place to begin. It says, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations before him whom he believed, meaning that Abraham stood before God, who quickens the dead and calls those things that be not as though they were, who against hope, natural hope, all right, a consistent, constant expectation of bad, believed in hope, a consistent, constant expectation of good, the picture changed, so that he might become the father of many nations. Now, this is not what I'm teaching tonight, because we want to we want to continue to wrap up uh, the the covenant portion of this. But when it says that, it means without the picture changing, this wasn't occurring. Something had to flip in Abraham's thinking. It had to flip in his vision of himself. Until hope, until the picture changes, this promise isn't coming to pass. All right, the Bible's very plain there. As long as he saw himself. As Eliezer being his heir, Isaac's not coming. See, just because God wants to do something for you, if you don't allow him to supplant the picture you've had with the picture he has, he can't get it to you. What, What does Isaiah tell us? Let the unrighteous man forsake his way. Let the wicked man forsake his thoughts. Then he uses the word for. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. Isn't that what he said? For as the rain comes down from heaven and the snow and waters the earth and does not return again, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It will accomplish the thing that I sent it to do. Isn't that what it says? Well, what's the Word? The Word is the picture builder. The Word of God is what builds within you a picture that God wants you to see. Amen. And without that, nothing changes. Glory to God. Remember, I was telling you, uh, in 2010, I was facing that physical challenge, and there was, there was a, 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 a healing CD by Keith Moore, and I would put that in every morning. And one of those songs on that CD was, I See Me as Healed. Yes. It said, there's a picture in my spirit of a strong and healthy man. Praise God. You understand? Yes. Amen. 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 And that's what I would put on and listen to and read the word and declare what God had said. Now, I'm not staying here. I'm just trying to, to get you to see that the picture had to change. I knew I was healed, but there was a contrasting picture that was trying to come into my spirit. Yes. Yes. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. That's good. And, and some of the biggest problems that people face, some of the biggest issues that you're facing here tonight with some people in here, is that there's another picture that's trying to trespass on the picture that God's trying to show you. And that's why God will give you a word. That's why God will say things. That's why God will give you a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge. He's supplementing the picture that you see in the word. Amen. So Abram, at the time God promised him, he's 75 years old. And he's already given up hope of having a child because his wife can't bear children. So it doesn't matter how healthy he is, his wife can't bear children. That's the question he asked God in Genesis chapter 18. He said, shall a child be born of one that is barren? And Abraham fell on his face, the Bible says, and laughed. Abraham and Sarah laughed. Sarah laughed when she heard God talking outside the tent. And Abraham laughed in God's face. God's standing there talking to Abraham and he fell on the ground. Abraham fell out laughing. So that, what, what picture does that tell you he had? Barren wife. Doesn't, doesn't matter. And, and, and then it goes on till his body's dead. Because remember, after that, he got with Hagar and tried to make his own picture. 
and messed everything up. Amen. You understand? And then God came to him and told him, or actually before that, God, he got with Hagar, and God came to him and said, In Isaac is who my covenant's with. All this is building a picture. Ishmael's great, praise God. I'm going to make him great, he's going to be mighty, but my covenant's with Isaac. Amen. What did God say to you? That's the picture you build. Praise God, that's so good. You understand? Don't get off there trying to make things happen. Don't go get two more jobs trying to make the picture God wants to bring across in your life into your life. Don't go get into debt trying to get the house or get the car that God wants you to have that He promised to give you. Don't go strangle yourself with a debt load trying to build a picture of what God wants to give you for free. You understand? That's important. Amen. Do you understand that? Well, God opened up this way for me to go do that, okay? Then that's between you and God. I'm I'm trying to help you with a picture. If God said He would give you something, then God will give it to you, and there's a blood covenant that backs up what God said He would do for you. You understand? Sometimes you're in a place of taking a step. Take that step and let God build the picture. Because you've got to understand, you're not going to rush God. You can slow Him down, but you're not going to rush Him. Let me come over here where they believe me. You're not going to rush God. All right? Brother Hagin said most of the time people are out ahead of God. They get out ahead of God. God's not going to speed up to catch up to you. Oh, I'm behind. I better catch up. No, He's not behind. The Bible says His ways are perfect. Right? And Psalm says that He will make all things beautiful in their time. So what do I do? I get in on God's timing. I see that's a whole other message for a whole other day. Amen. All that out of that sentence, who against hope believed in hope. you you got to understand that. So God is, try, God is supplanting that picture of bearingness, of, of childlessness, and He's supplanting that picture with another picture in order that Abraham could receive this promise. Amen. Now, that He might become the Father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall your seed be. And being not weak in faith, He considered not His own body, So he didn't think his age was a factor. All right. King James kind of does us a disservice there because he did. He did look at it. The Greek says he fully took it into consideration. He just didn't consider it a factor. To disrupt what God had said. Amen. When he was about 100 years old or the deadness of Sarah's womb. So do you see the picture he's got to overcome? Now he's 100 years old, and he's impotent. His body's dead. Sarah has always been barren. But he, he had so replaced the original picture, he said, eh, no big deal. Praise God. Do you see that? Yes. Tell your neighbor, whatever you're facing yes. is not a big deal yes. when you're looking at God's picture. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, my son and, and, and his beautiful wife, our daughter, Rebecca, they come by the house intermittently and they keep bringing us pictures of our grandbaby. Amen. Amen. You understand? Just bringing us pictures. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I'm already planning. I'm already putting the nursery together. Already getting things together. All right, I told him. I took him back in the house. I said, now this is, this is baby's nursery right here. Yeah, we're ready. I'm planning. I, I'm planning. Amen. I, I'm, I'm ready to go shoot guns with him already. Or her. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. But it's a picture. I've seen the picture. I am Grandpa. Yo soy abuelo. How do I know? I've seen a picture. 
I'm not hoping to be Papa. I am. Why? I've seen the picture. I've seen the picture. It's there. The baby exists. Do you hear me? I'm not looking to be better. I'm not looking to be blessed. I'm not looking to be healed. I am. I am. Why? I've seen the picture. There's a picture in my spirit. And it's based on something that cannot be revoked or repealed or changed. You understand? The Bible says, the Bible says even if it's a man's covenant, you can't disannul it. And it's not a covenant between two men. It's a covenant between a God, God and a man. Amen. Amen. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. So we've seen the factor that, that sealed the promise of God to Abraham was the blood covenant that God made between himself and Abraham and Abraham's seed after him. Genesis chapter 15, verse 17 through 18 tells us that in that day, God made a covenant with Abraham. All right? Now, the blood of the Abrahamic covenant did something. It paved the way for God to get Jesus in the earth and give his blood, which would redeem us from our sin. Now, this covenant opened the door. It paved the way for this to occur. Now, hallelujah. Look at Genesis chapter 1. We got to go back to the beginning. And the picture that I want to build for you tonight, according to this covenant, is one of ownership. Praise God. Praise God. All right? See, because, and maybe even in here, hopefully not, but maybe, too many Christians still have this idea that we're just stewards. <laughs> well, I'm just a steward over over this. Really? Well, then why do you do it with the scripture that says the earth is the Lord's and he's given it to the children of men? I am a steward in the sense that I take care of what God gave me, but I'm an owner. Why? Because I'm part of the family. See, it's not about taking back what the devil stole from you. It's about ownership. Because if you keep chasing what the devil stole from you, then that's not owning. Now, in Genesis 1, 26, it says, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man... In his own image, in the image of God, created he him. Male and female, created he them. Let me ask you a real simple question. Is that the Bible? Yes. Is there anything there that would be uh, an exaggeration? No. So God created man in his image. Yes. In his likeness. Yes. Right or wrong? Right. Amen. Amen. Do you see that? And what did he do? He set him and gave him dominion. Right? Yes. Let, let's, let's look at this again. And he gave him dominion. God blessed them. Gave them dominion over the fowl of the air. Over the cattle. Watch. Over all the earth. Do you see this? Amen. Amen. When God created man, he created him as near like himself as it was possible to create. Deity created man as close to deity as he could. Yes. Praise God. I mean, there will only ever be one God. Man will never be God. Now, you've heard this before. But let it sink in and build a picture. But we are in the God class. Yes. Amen. All right? 
Man was never created to be a slave. Never created to be a servant. Created to own. Now you're... You'll say, well, pastor, what's this got to do with the the blood covenant? Because you've got to see where God created us to understand why there had to be blood between you and God. Amen. Because if you don't understand why there had to be blood, I've got to see where I fell from so I could understand the lengths that God went to to restore that back to me. You understand? So, Man was created to be God's companion. People say, well, God created man because he wanted a family. No. God created man because he created this earth for man. God God created man because God is love. And he wanted to bestow his love. He wanted to bestow his grace. He wanted to bestow his father nature. You understand? And he created somebody to co-rule this earth with him. Amen. Amen. Man was given dominion over all the works of God's hands. Amen. Not over just the animal kingdom. Psalm chapter 8, verse 3 through 6 says, You have put all things under his feet. What is man that you're mindful of him? Or the son of man that you visited him? Right? Look at that next verse for me. For you have made him a little lower than the angels. The word there is Elohim. E-L-O-H-I-M. Same word that we see right here in Genesis chapter 1, where it says, And God said... Elohim said. The King James translators had a problem with saying you made him a little lower than God. One Hebrew translator says you have made him just a shade lower than yourself. Praise God. You understand? That's why man was in the God class. Man is in the God class. Are you with me? The voice Bible says, you placed the Son of Man just beneath God and honored Him like royalty. Hallelujah. So man was not subject. See, you've got to understand something. When God created man, man was not subject to any law. Because there was no law. Now, Why is this important? Because man was not subject to any being but God or to any law but the law of love. How do we know that it was the law of love in the beginning? Because that's the law Jesus brought us back under was the law of love. Do you hear me? The sin of Adam, the sin of Adam was not so much eating of the fruit of the tree although that was part of it, it was treason. Adam, what did Paul say when he wrote to Timothy? He said Eve was deceived, but Adam wasn't deceived. So Adam, with the full and complete knowledge of what he was doing, chose to disobey God. He chose to do it. Now, he was created in the image of God. He was created in the likeness of God. He was created to be God's co-ruler. He was created to be God's companion. He was created with complete and total dominion, not just over the animal kingdom, not just over the earth, over the works of God's hands. Do you hear me? Yes, sir. So that means, are the stars the work of God's hands? The universe... So Adam was created with authority over those things. That's why Jesus, who was the last Adam, could speak to wind and waves and they obeyed him. Because he was operating in original ownership, original authority, original dominion. 
And that's why when God finds somebody that will operate in that original authority and original dominion, powerful things happen in those lives because they step out and they take a place of ownership rather than servantship to the situation. Do you hear me? So the sin of Adam was high treason. Look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. And when the woman saw the tree was good for food, pleasant to the eyes, a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit and ate and gave to her husband and he ate. And the eyes of them both were open and they knew they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Treason is the offense of attempting by overt acts to overthrow the government of the state to which the offender owes allegiance. Adam owed his very existence to God, and in this moment, he tried, listen, whether it was a, con- it had to be conscious. He knew what was going to happen. Adam wasn't dumb. Besides God, he was the most, he was the brightest thing on the block. Right? But in that, see, that's just sin, period. You're in here tonight, and you know the Bible says the wages of sin is death. So if a person goes out and sins, knowing that the Bible says the wages of sin is death, and some amount of death ensues, they can't go to God and say, why'd this happen? You knew. The the enemy was trying to overthrow God. Right? Right? Adam joined in that treason. That was his sin. Now, in Genesis 22, so I want you to see where he fell from. Very often we just see Adam in a garden Enjoying the apples and the bananas. You know, naming the animals. I call you hippopotamus. You know? And sure enough, he did that. All right? But listen, he was owner. Get a hold of this. God walked with him. God himself Adam was clothed in the glory of God. God didn't have to put him in a cleft of a rock and let him just see his back parts. He walked hand in hand, face to face with God. Adam and Eve were clothed in the glory of God. God communed with him face to face. Amen. He was God's man. Exercising ownership and dominion in the earth. Amen. Taking what God said and spreading it throughout the earth. And in a moment of time, in the full light of the knowledge of what he was doing, he essentially took out a pen and signed over dominion to Satan. Amen. Now, Genesis 22, verse 15, I want you to see this. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because you've done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing I will bless you, multiplying I will multiply you as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and your seed, notice, shall be the gate of his enemies and in your seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed so the essence of these covenants was this all that I have is yours everything that I possess is yours if you need it therefore because that was the essence of this covenant God had a right through the covenant to demand of Abraham that he give him his son. Say it out loud. God needed Abraham's son. God needed Abraham's son. I see God's working on something. 
All right. He's found a man in the earth that will believe him. Because when Adam sinned, he put the dominion of the earth into the hands of Satan. Now, here's, here's the thing. We know this. You know, we've heard preaching on this. But here's the problem. Is that then we go out and we know we have dominion and we know we have authority, but we exercise very little of it. That's why in many churches you still have a lot of testimonies about how the devil's fighting and the devil's winning and the devil's doing everything he can and the devil's this and the devil's that. Right? When Jesus Christ Himself in the book of Luke before He ever went to the, to the cross of Calvary gave the apostles authority over devils and demons and unclean spirits. Amen. And told them that nothing would by any means hurt them. And that, that, was, that, that was dominion that He gave them simply because they believed in Him. They weren't even born again. The blood of Jesus Christ had not even been shed, and they were casting out devils. They were operating in a level of ownership that the world had not seen since the days of the Garden of Eden, and they weren't even born again. Amen. Do you understand that? And so when Adam sinned, he turned and he gave dominion over the earth into the hands of Satan. Amen. God's enemy. All the kingdoms of the world were under his authority. How do we know that? Luke chapter 4. He came to Jesus and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And he said, all the power over these kingdoms I'll give you if you just bow down and worship me. In other words, oh, oh, the last day, he didn't know, he, he didn't see him as the last Adam. But here's God in the flesh. Here's a man, Jesus, in the earth. And he comes and he tries to get Jesus to commit the same act of treason that Adam committed. Amen. It was valid or it wouldn't be in the Bible. If, if Satan was lying and Jesus let him perpetrate a lie, then, then Jesus is not a good example. If it wasn't a temptation, then the Bible's not true. It was a temptation. How could he offer him authority and dominion? He had it. Amen. See, people will say, well, did, did Adam have a legal right to do what he did. Yes. Not a moral right. But a legal right. It was morally wrong. Legally. It was within his power. Do you see this? Adam gave them to Satan. And here's what happened. It made God an outsider. On the planet he had created. Well, but God came to the earth before. No, 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 no. You gotta, you gotta. They saw epiphanies. When, when the Bible says the Lord came and talked with Abraham, that wasn't God becoming flesh. That was God looking like a man. Putting on some skin. He didn't become a man until the incarnation. Now, why is that important? Because that was, the, that was the foundation of the blood covenant. It had to be made with a man. Had to be made with a man. It had to be real blood. It had to be a real human being. Because Abraham had a right to be in this earth. And if God can get in the earth and get a man to believe him and to come into covenant with him, then, you understand? Yes, then, 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 then if, you, if you will, the, the, the best way to look at this is then there is a, a way in here because a per listen, listen, you bother the devil because you have a birth certificate. That's right. That's right. Come on. That's right. You belong here. I belong here. He's the one that doesn't belong here. He's an outsider. He's an outlaw. He's trespassing. Not us. The earth has been given to us. It's our right. We're allowed to be here. 
Amen. Why? Because there's blood between us and God that he shed, that he cut a covenant with our father Abraham. And then he sent Jesus. I don't want to get ahead of myself. You understand? It's, it's our, this earth is our birthright. Amen. The devil's the one trying to tear it up. And we're here to stop him. Amen. We're not eating the fruit. We're not giving our dominion away. Amen. Am I helping anyone? See, when God redeems people on the earth, he has to do it through legal channels. Now, listen to me. I'm just... Listen to me. This is the only way you will ever understand the legal side of redemption. And it will put all that nonsense about grace and law to rest. That's nonsensical. I want you to understand that. That's not what ought to be being taught in the New Testament church. Praise God. Do you hear me? Well, Pastor, what do you mean by that? Listen, listen. Here's the bottom line. Everybody in here, you're Gentiles. You were never under law. That's right. You were under the curse. Yes. And Christ redeemed you from the curse. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. Never been you. Do you understand? Yes. It'll put it all to rest. The legal side of redemption is that God had to legally, legally find a way into the earth. Yes. That's good. Do you hear me? Now, God operates in perfect justice. Adam had legally transferred to Satan the authority God had given him. And that's why you'll hear people say, so when all those Buddhists that didn't believe in Jesus, they stand before God and they go to hell, that's not fair. God's not fair. He's just. Not fair. Just. He's a God of perfect justice. Right? And he said, this is the way. Amen. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by him. Yes. Right? So it's perfectly just. God operates in perfect justice. Now, Adam had legally transferred to Satan the authority that God had given him. He transferred it. People say, well, he didn't know what he was doing. Yes, he did. He knew what he was doing. He knew exactly what he was doing. If, if it had been ignorance and he had been deceived, the Bible leaves the door open that that could have been corrected. Do you hear me? Because he would not have willfully known what he was doing. But he knew. Amen. So if God had not been absolutely just... He would have taken the authority from Satan, punished man, right? But instead of that, he made provision for man's redemption. Showing his love to man based on perfect justice. You understand? Because you've got to understand something. God has never not owned the earth. It's always been God's. But because of perfect justice, because God does things through legal channels, He had to back off. Because His representative had given dominion away. I've had people before say, well, why don't God do something for me? Because you're the establishing witness. You are the one with the authority and the dominion in your life. Yes. And God, because He is perfectly just and operates through legal channels, will not come into your life and make you do anything or make anything happen for you that you're not taking the initiative and putting into operation. Nobody gets healed unless they want to. Amen. Nobody gets blessed unless they want to. Nobody gets saved unless they want to. Amen. Why? Because God's not going to make anybody do anything. Because He's perfectly just. 
Well, what about all this and, and, these, and these people and, and they're killing babies and the child molesters and all this and, and you're just saying God doesn't want to violate their free will. No, that's sin. And listen, do you hear me? Yeah. They're going to they're gonna pay. Yeah. Yeah, amen. Because God's perfectly just. Yes. And if they don't change and get saved, they'll pay the price for what they did. Yeah. Yes. Amen. Yeah. Do you see that? He's perfectly just. Well, I wish God would do something. But the better question is, what do I need to do? I'm helping you tonight. What dominion do I need to take? I have a blood covenant, and there's a reason I have a blood covenant. There's a reason that God did what He did. Amen. Now notice, in Genesis 22, verse 17, In blessing I will bless you, multiply, and I will multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven. And as the sand which is upon the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. This is talking about the church. And talking about the day that the church would possess the gate of their enemy. Jesus said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against my church. Why? He's prophesying a day of future dominion, a day of future ownership and authority. Watch, not that's coming, that He died to give us. Based on this Abrahamic covenant. He makes the promise right here based on Abraham giving his son to God. And he says, because you've given me your son, now, let me tell you, somebody in your lineage, your seed is going to possess the gate of their enemy. Hallelujah. Do you see that? God had to become a man. Why? In order to receive blood. He had to become a man to receive blood. What makes you legal on this earth is your blood and your birthright. The body of Christ is on the earth today. But Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. What is He doing? Henceforth expecting until His enemies be made His footstool. Who are the ones that are bringing the enemy into subjection and putting them under His feet? The body of Christ in the earth. He is the head of the body, but we're the body. We're the ones with a legal right. When Jesus finished His work on the earth and redeemed mankind, He rose from the grave and came back to this earth and and was here for 40 days in a flesh and bone body. No blood, flesh and bone. Why? All of His blood had been poured out. Right? Do, Do you hear me? Now where is he at? Now he's at the right hand of the Father. He's resting. He's waiting. He's interceding. He's doing what the Bible says he's going to do. Why isn't he living in a house on this earth? The work of restoring dominion was completed. He is now waiting on you and I to bring the enemies under his feet. We're the ones with blood. We're the ones with a birthright to be here. Amen. He gave us all authority, all dominion. He said, all power in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Now you go. Amen. That was why he came and put that blood covenant into operation. Amen. Am I helping you at all? So he had to become a man in order to receive blood. So he could be a part of the covenant. And to exclude the devil. you got to understand something. This had to be done in real blood to exclude the enemy. Why? He doesn't have any blood. He can't get into it. See, quit paying so much attention to what the devil says. He doesn't have anything to say about your covenant. He has no vote. Amen. He has no vote. He has one option. Under my feet. Flee. Why why does the Bible say things like that? Because we have the dominion. Now see, we can surmise, but what if Adam would have done that? Look, now you're not playing that game in this garden. Well, I wish he would have. Well, but he didn't. And God knew he wasn't going to. And God doesn't play catch up to the devil. Does he? 
I think some of y'all got upset with me when I talked about grace and law. I just really feel that in my spirit. Don't get upset with me. But as long as you keep that in your mind, you're going to struggle with that. It, it is, it's not hard for me to walk under grace. I don't even think about the law. If, if, you, if you think about law, come on up here and get saved. And get delivered and get free. I'm not, I'm not working my way back to Jesus. That's not what I'm doing. I've been made free. Every day. Mm. Amen. Right? You just need a little help. That's not what we're doing. Amen. We've been made free. We've been made free. Why? Because us Gentiles were not bought. Listen, we were not brought in by the blood of Jesus under the law and then made free. We were brought directly under from under the curse into the blessing of Abraham. It was overnight. We went from being cursed to being blessed. Cursed to being blessed. And if those that were born under the law and those that lived under law, if they just wise up, they had been brought out from under the law and brought under the blessing. Am I helping you? Oh, I got to hurry. Amen. God said, because of Abraham's obedience all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Because God found a man in his covenant partnership who was willing to offer his son as a sacrifice. Now God can come back and offer his son as a sacrifice. Through legal means. You understand? There's blood between that man and God. And now there's a legal way to get into the earth. Hallelujah. Do you see that? And for 2,000 years that was prophesied. Amen. When the, in the book of Luke, when the angel showed up in the shepherd's field on the night, we call it the night of the nativity. But remember what the Bible says. It says that Suddenly, these angels showed up. And here's what they said. Peace on earth. Goodwill toward men. What was that announcement? There's peace now on the earth. Goodwill toward men. Well, that was always God's desire. But up till that night, He wasn't in the earth. Now he's in the earth. And now there's peace on the earth. Woo! Amen. How was there peace on the earth? The prince of peace had been born. God's good will towards men was in human form. He was laying in that manger. He was being nursed by Mary. She was holding the good will of God towards his people. She was changing the peace of God in that stable. God, God is man. God, God is son in the earth. Amen. Amen. Why? Because somebody 2,000 years before that had believed God and said, I'll split the heifer in the, in the middle. I'll cut the ram down the middle. And sat there and watched God walk through covenant blood and said, I believe every word you said. And when God said, give me now your son, your only son, Abraham went very willingly to do it. And he went to that mountain and he offered his son to God. And God received Isaac as a symbol. God received God, Isaac as a down payment on his son that was going to come back. His son, his only son at the time. God gave his only son so he could reap a harvest of his seed and destroy the dominion of the enemy. My Lord, my Lord, my Lord. Do you see that? Amen. He asked for his only son and he gave his only son. So he could be the firstborn among many brethren. And now there's billions of people in the God class on the earth. 
and the enemy doesn't know what to do with them. Oh, I'm, I'm got ahead of myself, but let me hurry. So God said, because of Abraham's obedience, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Abraham opened up the door for Jesus to come and die on the cross. This was so masterfully done, the enemy didn't know what was going on. I'm telling you, the boy isn't right. Uh, you, you understand? It was so masterfully done. He got Jesus in the earth. Now see, you've got to understand something. He found a man that would believe him, and he made a covenant that opened the door to get his son in the earth. Then he had to find a woman that even though she was a virgin would believe that she could become pregnant. Because a man couldn't be involved. See, the seed of the man, the seed of the man is the world under the curse. The seed of the woman is Jesus. Every man, woman, boy and girl was under the curse except one. Every man, woman, boy and girl on this earth was born under the curse, born under spiritual death, born under the dominion, the authority, the ownership, if you will, of Satan, except one. And that was the one that God had cut a covenant with Abraham to get in the earth. And then he sent the angel Gabriel to that little town in Israel. And he found, depending on what you believe, a young girl, 13 to 16 years of age. And he said, look, you're highly favored of God. And this is what's going to happen. God wants you to bear his son in the earth. And she said, okay, I understand, but how is this going to happen? Because I'm not married, I've never known a man. And they said, yep, that's exactly why we're here. And here's what's going to happen. Here's what's going to happen. The power of the Holy Ghost is going to overshadow you. And the life-giving force of God's going to come in your body. And that that is going to be formed in you is the Son of the living God. And now watch, now he's got a blood covenant that opened the door. Now he's got a girl in the earth that will believe him that's never known a man. And now the seed of the Son of God is implanted in that womb. No man has been involved. The the blood that flows through that baby's veins is the very blood of God himself that's never known sin. But it's still real blood. It's still real. And from that baby's first cry, he was born with dominion. Here all over again is Adam in the earth. I said here all over again is Adam in the earth. Because Abraham said, I'll take my son to the mountain. Because Abraham said, whatever you want, I'll give you. Because Abraham said, yes, sir, I believe you. And it was counted to him for righteousness. And now 2,000 years later, God's got his son in the earth. Woo! And the death toll, the death bell for the enemy started ringing. The days of man's dominion under the, under the punishing fist and thumb and heel of Satan, and they're coming to an end. And he grew up and he grew in favor with God and man. And everywhere he went, devils were cast out. People were healed. Dead people were raised. Blind eyes were opened. There was not one answer the enemy had for him because he's dealing with the God man. My God. Man, it's Wednesday and I'm preaching like this. Do you hear me? Hallelujah. Do you hear me? I say, I got to hurry. Because now listen. And he lives out his life on this earth. Everywhere he went, he'd run into the demons. They'd say, what are you doing here? We know you. But there wasn't anything they could do about it because he had blood. He had a birth certificate. He had an earthly father on the earth, not one that was involved in his conception, but he had a mama. 
that had... You understand? Yes. Now, I'm going to show you something in just a minute. Her water had broke naturally. There were labor pains. Yes. That night in Bethlehem, the Son of God took His first human breath on this earth yes. and He was literally, physically, naturally born of a woman. Yes. Yes. And because of that, there wasn't anything the devil could do about it. Look at Galatians chapter 4. Look at Galatians chapter 4. Am I helping anybody tonight? Yes. Am I helping you? All right, give me some. Praise God. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. My God, my God. Galatians chapter 4. Verse 4, I'm, I'm, I'm going to hurry, try to get you out of here. Whew. Do, you, do you see why it's so important that you understand the blood between us and God? When you minimize either one of these things, when you minimize the Abrahamic covenant, you minimize the length that God took to get Jesus into the earth. If Abraham doesn't believe God, Jesus has a hard time getting in the earth. He had to believe him. Oh, God would have got it done. Yes, he would have. He did. He got it done. But the principle, the reason it's in the word is Abraham believed God and opened up the door for God to get Jesus in the earth to save us Amen. legally. Amen. Oh, glory. Folks, I'm telling you this, this that I'm teaching you changed my life. It transformed my thinking. It transformed everything about what I knew about God. Nobody, the churches I went to, nobody was teaching this. I had to learn it on my own. I had to get in the Word and find out. Amen. Amen. And then I found a tape series by Kenneth Copeland, how God would cut a covenant with you. It changed my life. It changed my life. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. One translation says, the mirror translation says, but, when, but then the day dawned, the most complete culmination of time. The Son arrived, commissioned by the Father. Watch. His legal passport to the planet was His mother's womb. See, now there's nothing the devil can do about this. There's nothing he can do because Jesus is in the earth. He's exercising dominion on every... No but. He said, nobody takes my life. I give it. I lay it down. How can you take the life of somebody with complete dominion? All those times they tried to kill him, Jesus exercised a complete and utter authority over death. And when it came time to pay the price, he chose to let death take him. The Bible says he gave his life a ransom for many. He looked at Pilate and Pilate said, don't you know I have the power to give your life or take it? And Jesus said, you would have no power, no authority, no dominion over me at all if I didn't let you. If it wasn't given to you by my Father. He said, even right now, I could call 12 legions of angels and they would deliver me from your hand. Don't you think for one second, Mr. Pilate, that you're taking anything. I'm giving it away. Why? Why do you have to give his life? Because Adam gave dominion away. And the only way to get dominion back was to be a willing sacrifice. To become one that was willing to be punished by death, punished by the traitor, punished by the terrorist Satan, and go into the belly of the earth and be there for three days and nights being punished in hell and rising victorious over death, hell, and the grave. How could he rise again victorious? Because he had never sinned. He was exercising complete authority over death. And it's all based on the blood covenant. 
Amen. That's why he kept saying, I'm going to be crucified. Three days later, I'm coming up. I'm coming back again. Amen. Do you hear me? Well, what happened to him in hell? He suffered all the punishment that hell could mete out. You understand that? Do you understand that? He suffered it there. Why? Because redemption had to be complete. Redemption had to be twofold. There had to be the physical death of the sacrifice and there had to be the spiritual death of the sacrifice. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah, in the original Hebrew, it says that he made his grave with the rich in his death, the King James says. The literal translation is in his deaths. D-E-A-T-H-S. Plural. He died physically and he died spiritually. Why? You were not dead physically when you came to Christ, but you were dead spiritually. A, just a physical atonement would not have taken care of the problem. But because there was a spiritual dying on the part of the man on the cross with dominion, God was able to redeem you, spirit, soul, and body. My Lord, my Lord, my Lord. Do you understand that? Now let me try to finish this up. Is it okay if I take about five minutes? You know about the gulf in the book of Luke. Now remember, his legal passport into the planet was his mother's womb. You understand? Now, obviously, when the righteous dead died, they didn't go to heaven. They went to paradise. They went to a place in Sheol, Gehenna, Hades, hell, under the earth. All right? But it was separate. There was an impassable gulf. You read that in the book of Luke with the rich man and Lazarus. Abraham was in Abraham's, the, the, the Jews called it Abraham's bosom, paradise. Lazarus was with Abraham. Why was Lazarus with Abraham? He believed in God. Do you hear me? Now watch. When Jesus died, he went to that place, but not to paradise, to hell. Why? Every sinner, every sinner that dies in their sin and goes to hell will suffer a needless punishment. Because Jesus already suffered that punishment for them. So see, I want to evade it, don't you? I'm not going. But when he died, <laughs> and the claims of justice was fulfilled, <laughs> he crossed over the gulf. And went to the man... That had said, I believe God. Yes. And made a covenant. And said, I'm the Redeemer. Glory to God. And he ministered to those spirits that were in captivity, the Bible says. What, listen, what does it mean they ministered to them? Remember in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 12, 11, 12 13, it says this. It says that they did not see the promise with their physical eyes, but they embraced it, they held on to it, and they believed that it was coming. Yes. Amen. Amen. And when he went over into paradise, he ministered to them. What does that mean? He proclaimed to them, I am the promised seed. I am the one that God said was going to be in your lineage, Abraham, that would possess the gates of his enemy. Now, look at me. I am possessing the gates of our enemies. And he took captivity and he led them captive. And he took Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and all the saints under the old covenant. Covenant, and he marched them into heaven, into the presence of God. All based on a covenant that he made with a man. Wow. Do you hear me? And then, and then he rose from the dead, rose from the grave. Amen. With all power and all authority. And gave it to us. 
Amen. Amen. Gave it to us. There's blood between us and God. Amen. There's blood on the mercy seat today based on that blood covenant. I'm, uh, I got to quit. Amen. Do you see that? What I'm trying to get across to you tonight as I'm closing, is you got to get that picture. Quit, quit, quit fussing about this, this stuff that don't mean anything. I have dominion. I have authority. I'm sorry that you don't believe God heals, but I have authority over sickness, and I'm not going to be sick. Amen. I'm sorry that you, that person may not believe that God wants to bless them financially, but I have authority over poverty, and I'm not going to be broke. I'm going to operate in my dominion. I, I'm sorry that that person's walking in fear. I'll not be afraid another day in my life. I refuse to be afraid because there is no fear in love. Am I helping you at all? Don't fuss about that. Well, what do you think about this? I think I have dominion. That's what I think about that. Am I making sense? And you walk in that. You build a picture of that. That's why Jesus came. That's why Jesus came into this earth. God got the door opened and got his son in the earth. And the price is paid. When he said it is finished. Yes, it was the work of his work on the earth. Yes, it was the law. But it was more importantly, the dominion that Satan had. Do you understand that? Jesus came to free us from so much more than the law. That's elementary stuff, man. I'm serious. That's elementary. That's preschool. He came to deliver you from spiritual dominion, from a terroristic overlord, a murderer, a thief, a liar that was holding you in prison. When the Bible says here he came to redeem them, it's that, it's that Greek word that's translated the same way four different times, four different ways in the New Testament. It means that he marched into the slave market. It's the word that means to buy up, to buy back, to buy out of. He walked into the slave market of sin and bought of the dominion of Satan. He didn't come to buy us out of the dominion of the law. He came to buy us out of the dominion of Satan. The only reason why there needed to be a law was because of the dominion of Satan. He came and delivered us from the dominion of Satan and obliterated the law. Did away with it. Fulfilled it. It's complete in Christ. I am free, not just from the law, from the curse of the law, from the dominion of Satan, from the power and the authority of that evil, wicked overlord that Jesus destroyed in mortal combat. My Lord, you have no claim on me. You have no claim on my children. You have no claim on my life. You have no claim on my health. You have no claim on my money. I've been set free. I've been delivered. I've been, that power has been broken. Glory to God. Woo. Hebrews 2.14 says, because the children were partakers of flesh and blood, he himself also, Jesus, became a partaker of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. Amen. Amen. I'm not making light of, of what anybody says or teaches or does. But I'm just telling you, don't get hung up on that. Jesus came and died and shed his blood to free me from the dominion of Satan. You understand? Amen. And it says that Jesus destroyed him. That is the word that means to strip, to make naked, to paralyze. Do you hear me? He has no weapons to fight you with. No weapon formed against you will prosper. Why? You have all authority, all power, all dominion, all rights on this earth. Say out loud right now, I have a right on this earth. I have a right. Satan is the outsider, Satan is the outsider. Not, me. not me and right now, and right now I, take my I take my position 
of dominion and authority and ownership. I am God's man or woman in this earth. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Let's stand up tonight. Praise God. Did you receive anything tonight? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you what, that's why addiction can't hang on. Because you got authority over that. You got dominion over that. Anything that steals, kills, and destroys. I have authority over that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Quit fighting the battle and walk in your ownership. There's blood between you and God. I'm helping you tonight. Because... As you're standing, I, I need to get this to you. I, I know I've kept you a little later tonight. But you need to understand this. There are things that weaken us. When we focus on, on it can even be a good thing. But when you focus so much on these things that don't matter, that Satan will get you away from your authority, from your dominion. He wants your financial situation to be the biggest thing in your mind other than your dominion over that financial situation. Amen. Amen. That's why he uses, he uses law to get people away from their dominion. He uses people that think they need to pray two more hours a day and the devil will leave them alone. Or study three more chapters a day and the devil will leave them alone. That's legalism. That's law. When that person could just stand up and say, No, in the name of Jesus, I refuse that and I'm not going to operate that way. Leave in Jesus' name. But you got thousands and millions of people that are trying to pray an extra three hours a day to get the devil off their back. I'm going to write on my back, period. Amen. First song I ever heard Brother Buzz sing was if, the, if, if you let the devil ride, he's going to want to drive. Amen. You, you let him mess with you and he's going to want to take over. I'm in dominion. This has been big in my spirit all week. I'm the one with dominion here. Amen. Take the hand of your neighbor. Praise the Lord God Almighty. Glory to God. Glory to God. Wow, wow, wow. Bunch of owners around here. Amen. Amen. Tell your neighbor the vision of our church will always be to build people's faith and frame their world by the Word of God. You and I will always be world changers. God bless you. Yep. Oh, yeah. That was good. <laughs>